You're listening to The Echoes with me, Emily Andrew, the self-development podcast that explores personal stories, powerful tools, and an insight into the wide world of mental, physical, and spiritual health. Get ready to get curious, be inspired, and connect in. I am going to tell you something that has absolutely blown my mind since learning about it. And it's actually also helped me to understand myself so much better and give myself a break. And before I go into this, I'm going to ask you to listen to what I'm about to say and just see what comes up for you. So without needing to close your eyes, you may want to if you are sat and you're not driving, I want you to imagine that you are walking along a beach. Walking along the sand, feeling the sand between your toes and listening as the waves crash against the shore. And as you look out into the horizon, the sun is setting and it's coloring the sky in beautiful oranges and reds and yellows. And the clouds are looking pink. You can taste the salty air on your tongue, feel the breeze on your face, and hear the call of the birds, feeling warm, feeling relaxed. And for some of you, you will have been able to really connect with a lot of what I've just said. Perhaps you could see certain images. Maybe you could sense some of the smells, some of the sounds, and perhaps, like me, there was none of that. All you did was listen to my voice. And maybe in your own head, repeat, the words that I'd said, or just had a knowing that that's what you were focusing on. And this is what I'm going to be talking about today because I have only just, at the age of 32, realised that when people ask you to picture something, or they use statements like I see it in my mind's eye, that they were actually being literal and it's not just a phrase, a term that people use. And since I've learned this, it's made so much sense in so many different ways. And it's also, I think, going to make things a lot easier for me going forwards. Because for the last few years, I have really struggled with my inability to be able to meditate with my inability to be able to remember how I looked at certain ages, with my inability to be able to picture my nan's face or even look in the mirror, shut my eyes and not be able to see my own. I've thought that something was wrong with me, that I've been blocked, that I perhaps am holding some kind of ancestral trauma I honestly have gone through all of the all of the scenarios that could possibly be the case. And actually being able to understand this about myself has been so eye-opening. And where whoever I've spoken to, I've found it so interesting to hear their perspective or if they are kind of similar to me, to be able to feel like I belong, that I'm not just this, you know, stunted, spiritually disconnected person that has, you know, no ability to to do anything. But what I'm talking about is something called aphantasia. So aphantasia is the inability to be able to visualize or create images in your mind's eye. And it comes into it's on a spectrum so you've got aphantasia and then the opposite end you've got hyperphantasia 
So hyperphantasia is the ability to be able to see realistic images. So for some people, if they shut their eyes and they're told to imagine an apple, some people will be able to see an apple in their mind's eye as if it was real life. Some people, like me, would just see blackness and just know that they're thinking about an apple. And some people are kind of in between. Some people might have a flash of an image, but they can't hold on to it. Some people might have an outline of an image, an image that's blurry, only able to see colour, or some kind of variation in between. And the scale runs from aphantasia to hypophantasia to fantasia to hyperphantasia. And there's various tests that you can do online that can help you to discover your own visual thinking style. The one I used is, it's pronounced VIVIQ, but it's basically the letters V, V, I, Q. And you can go on there, I think it's like a 15, 12 or 15 question um, thing, and it will tell you at the end what you are. So I've been down the rabbit hole with this, so you don't have to. Because some people that I've spoken to had never heard of this and were so interested. I had people getting in touch with me who had hyperphantasia and they couldn't fathom not being able to see anything, not, not having just having blackness because their minds were like a movie, playing all the time. And I think what this dive into this topic has done for me is not only validate my experience but also understand the positives and negatives in all directions because it was really easy for me to feel like I was broken to feel like there was something wrong with me to feel like it wasn't fair that I couldn't do that that I couldn't visualize people or images or places and it became kind of a bit of a stick of like, great, like this is something that's wrong with me. And I think it really came to a head for me when I was doing a matrix session. I was working with a fellow practitioner because you kind of do swaps when you're doing EFT and matrix just so that you can continue to work on your own stuff as well as um, kind of just keeping working with other people and different practitioners. I had kind of come up against the fact that I couldn't step into memories before. So whenever you're working with an issue with matrix or imprinting, you kind of go back to the memory. You don't become the echo, the younger version of yourself, but you step into the memory and you tap on the echo itself. And I remember when I was training, again, because I hadn't really thought realized this about myself I just kind of thought it was all um like an idea it wasn't a literal thing it was just step into the memory tap on the echo and that was that but the more that I started working with matrix and working with other people it became really clear to me that you know their visual element was so strong they would see things that they remembered or they would it, I just I started to feel like I was really un miss, missing something in my own practice and I'd said to, to the person that I was working with like I can't I can't see anything and I think they took it as because sometimes what happens is the the echo will not let themselves be seen Sometimes they kind of hide or they use something to like mask themselves so that it's a, it's a protective mechanism that our brains do. And I think they took that as me not it, it, it being a protective part of myself that wouldn't let me visualize that younger version of myself. And I think if you are somebody who is a visual thinker, then that definitely is something to explore because I think that it definitely has legs. But for me, never being able to visualize anything, I got very stressed with the fact that I couldn't see myself at that age. And I kind of tried to push through it and I worked on the echo and 
I, the way that I do it is by feeling. So I kind of get a sense of something. So I sense that back then I was feeling scared or this is what, it's kind of a sense and a knowing that I have. That's how I, I, I work with my imagination. But at the end of the session, they asked me, can you see her now? Is she clearer? And it just broke me because I felt like I, I was, I was broken. Like I was doing it wrong. Like it wasn't going to work for me because I couldn't do this. I couldn't visualize. It wasn't a picture. It was just a knowing. And it felt like I was kind of not faking it because I did feel a benefit from it. And I felt such benefits from matrix work, but it, it just felt really rubbish for me. And it was a, a period of, of trying to figure out, you know, is this a block? Is this something that somehow my mind's protecting me from? Um, we know that when we go through trauma that we can block out certain parts of our memory. And I don't have many childhood memories, but I think I've always found it a real struggle to connect with the things that I went through as a child are not abnormal to most other children's experiences. It's, it was what I made it mean. And, you know, the, the, the things that I, I believed from those experiences, I think, that maybe could have caused some element of trauma, but I just didn't ever connect with it. I, I wasn't, and I'm still not really sure if that, if I believe that I don't have childhood memories because I've experienced trauma. Um, if it is somewhere in there, then it's really deep because I've done a lot of work um, and it's not like the memories have come back. So I think that was something as well that, again, it was like a little flag of like, is there something wrong with me here? How can I not, how can I not remember these, you know, events from my childhood up until you know, seven, eight, nine. And even the memories that I have in later life, I don't trust them because I can't see them. And I've really, really second guessed myself at some quite serious things that have happened to me because I can't remember it visually. So it makes me question, did I actually experience that? So it's like my own mind is gaslighting me. And it all came to a head and when I realized that this is an actual thinking style, the, it just, it was like a relief. It was like a weight off my shoulders to say, okay, well, you're not completely abnormal because you're not on your own here. Um, and it's just the way that some people are built. And of course, with anything in this realm, I'm always interested to say, okay, well, can we change it? And maybe I will try and discover it. But for me, just sometimes that validation was the thing that I needed. So people that have or experience aphantasia, they think roughly it's about 2% of the population. People that experience hyperphantasia, they think it's around 3% of the population. And then everybody else is kind of in between. So even though obviously my memories are slightly affected by my aphantasia it, it doesn't make me bad at memorizing things I was in my son's nursery the other day and the nursery is connected to the primary school that I went to as a child and the other day I was walked up the stairs and I saw this woman and immediately I knew her name and she was only at the school for a short amount of time we weren't really friends we were everyone was friendly at my school but we weren't in, we, we never really hung out or went over to each other's houses. We didn't have that kind of relationship. And I knew I knew her. And I kind of said, oh, it is your name. And I said her name. And she said, yes, and kind of gave me a really weird look. And I said, oh, you, I, we went to school together at, at our school. And she was like, how did, how do you remember that? But I can do that with people that especially from a younger kind of childhood era, 
I really am good at remembering people's parents. Even though the time has passed, I'm really good at just being able to recognize a face. And mostly I remember the name. It's like I just have this knowing thing of them. And again, I don't remember what they looked like as a child in a visual sense, but I could tell you certain characteristics that make that person who they were. And I was having a conversation with my best, one of my best friends. We went out and we were talking about it. And she, uh, she doesn't know exactly where she is, but she's got the ability to remember people. And we were talking about the fact that, you know, we're talking about somebody that we went to school with when we were in our teens and how he was so different in adulthood. And she kind of said, but how do you know what he looked like then? If you can't picture him, how do you know what he looked like? And that's a really difficult question to explain because I just know, I just know what he looked like. There's no kind of, I don't remember people by the way they look, I remember people by the way that they make me feel. So with this particular person, I really fancied him. <laughs> so there was kind of, there was a lot of like emotions with this person. Um, and it was, I, I kind of remember the way that I felt around them and the way that they made me feel and the sense of them as a person. Those are the things that I will remember about people, which explains so much to me because I'm, I'm more of a feeler and a knower. And she said something to me which further blew my mind. And I'm not sure if anybody else who has aphantasia will resonate with this, but I wanted to put it into the podcast just in case. But I, she turned around to me and she said, maybe that's why you're so nostalgic. And I mean, my mind was already blown by understanding this about myself, but my, my mind was further kind of smashed to pieces with what she said. And it almost made me wanted to cry because A, she's one of my best friends. And so she sees me properly for who I am. And I am a really nostalgic person. To my detriment sometimes, I can get lost in memories. I can get lost in thinking about people that I have not had any connection to for years. I've had, I can get lost in remembering the good times from people who, even if they've hurt me, I miss the good times that we had. And I can still remember the bad stuff, you know, I, it's not a, a blindness in that sense. But when I think about my nanny, who I can't picture, and I can't hear her voice, and I can't smell what she smelled like, I cognitively know the kind of perfume she wears, but I couldn't bring that sense up to me. I only have the way that she makes me feel, and a knowing of her as a way to remember her. And obviously when you lose somebody and the pain that comes with losing somebody, the grief that comes with losing somebody, you you can kind of reconnect to all of those feelings again as well. So I remember people by the way that they make me feel. And it causes me to be extremely nostalgic. You know, if I meet somebody and I feel like there is a connection then that would, then they kept, they matter to me from then on. They're, you know, I will think about them, not in a creepy way, but like, I'll think about them, I will want the best for them. And I have this real sense of wanting to support that person. But it, it isn't a visual thing. And I wanted to say that out loud because I think even understanding the parts that we don't understand or just speaking the parts that we don't understand, I might have a few people who have hyperphantasia getting in touch with me and saying, well, that I, I, I connect to that too. And I think that that's the beautiful nuance to this because we are all so different and we are all so similar as well. We have different pockets and pieces that bring us all together. And that, that's the whole point of being a human. We are, we're different and the same all at the same time. And I've mentioned a couple of times the other senses so although aphantasia does generally just correlate to 
the the imagery or lack of imagery and hyperfantasia, the extreme uh, hyper realistic images. There, it can also be applied to the other senses. So I have done a test on um, it's called imaginationspectrum.com. And it asks you lots of different things. And to be honest, I found it really frustrating to do <laughs> because it was basically a 20 question test that just made me feel really like un unable to do anything. And I was basically like, no, 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 can't do it, can't do it. And so it was a bit of a crappy uh, exercise, but it's all in the name of me researching myself. So I have multi-sensory aphantasia. So I can't recall or, or bring up the feeling of the smell, the taste, the sound in terms of bringing a sound to life. Although I think that that is a nuanced area because I in my head right now have got Miley Cyrus singing flowers and I'm very connected to music and the way that people sound when they sing. So I think that there is a nuanced element to that. I might not be able to recall somebody's voice, but I can listen to a song a couple of times and and maybe it is just a knowing and understanding how that is in my body as well. But I can I I, I do feel like I can connect to hearing music in my head if I have an earworm, for example. And then you've also got touch as well as the movement element of it so touch and movement I was a little bit better if I think of an apple I can't visualize the apple I can't smell the apple I can't taste the apple but I have a feeling in my teeth when I think about biting the apple I kind of can almost grasp the feeling of the apple's smooth skin and the feeling of it in my hand but it's so that's not totally blank but we all have we all experience the world in different ways. We have stronger senses and in our mind's eye, it's exactly the same. So some people will be extremely visual. Some people will be able to remember smells and working in EFT and matrix, what often happens is these are all triggers or reminders when we are working on something. So I've worked with people on on experiences that have happened and they might be able to smell the perfume of the person that they were with and that could be a trigger for them because if they go and in day-to-day -day life they'll smell the smell it will trigger that memory and it could be an uncomfortable one so what we do is we tap on the smell or it could be the sound of somebody's voice if somebody had a gravelly voice we subconsciously have this trigger of if somebody has a gravelly voice then this 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 so it could be assumptions we make it might feel that we just have a bit of an unease about them and we would again we'd tap through that and whenever we're working if something comes up whether it be a visual memory a smell a taste a sound a feeling these are all flags for us to kind of pitch up to and to work through to help us to deepen down into the work instead of just using the factual information that we have in our hands. So being able to come at this kind of work from a multi-sensory approach is a really vital ability for anybody. So how do we do it when we don't have that as a resource? How do we do it? I had to think a lot about how things have actually worked for me. And some of these things you might find work for you as well if you have got aphantasia or, or perhaps other levels of it. I really have to trust the feelings that I get and connect in with my body in terms of where I feel it. And I also have to allow myself just to know and not second guess myself. So some of my memories may not be totally correct, but actually that doesn't really matter because they've done studies on memory and it's fascinating and maybe I'll talk about it on a different episode where they they kind of looked at the survivors of September 11th and they got them give a testimonial of what happened to them on that day 
And then they checked in with them again, like a few years down the line. And I think again, maybe a couple of times. And their, their stories, their memories of that day changed. And every single time they told that story, the, they were absolutely certain that those things had happened. But actually their memory had changed. So does it actually really matter if what we remember is fully true? I don't really think so. If it's affecting us in our lives, it doesn't matter if we're working through an imagined reality or the actual reality factually. It's the emotions and how we feel about it that are the real strong guiding lights that are going to help us to move through whatever we're trying to work through. Meditation has also been the bane of my life. <laughs> <laughs> and I don't know how many people would say that. Um, it's really annoyed me for the last few years as well because I just have that voice saying, breathe in, breathe out. Breathe in, breathe out. Think nothing. All you see is blackness. And I've just got a black experience with all that voice going on in my head. So it's been really frustrating because any kind of visualization meditation that I do, if, I, if I'm in the wrong headspace and I'm like, I can't see it, I can't see it, I can't connect to it, you know, they do lots of different visualizations with certain types of healing and I, I find it very difficult to grasp. I can just about get the feeling, and it's not, again, it's not a picture, but I can get the feeling of if it's light, if I'm sending light to different parts of my body, but... A lot of the time I have to just trust in the concept of it and allow myself just to feel and know than to try and come up with the perfect image of a river on a stream. So if you do struggle with meditation, ask yourself what it is about meditation that you actually struggle with. Is it because you can't connect to a visual feeling or is it because you have that inner voice? Not everybody does have an inner monologue and I'll talk about that in a minute, but it can, if, it, if that's a barrier, then it's about understanding how to work around it. So if you are somebody that struggles with visualization, then you might want to look at doing a mantra meditation where you repeat in your head the same phrase over and over again. So the traditional kind of yoga mantra is OM, where you would repeat that over and over again. It's safe for me to expand or I'm allowed to succeed whatever it is. But also I think it's about knowing that meditation doesn't have to just be one thing. If you look at some of the big minds in meditation, then they will ask you to just bring your awareness to a normal task in terms of walking. There's so many different types of meditation. There's moving meditations in terms of yoga or, or exercise. And it's just about maybe redefining, if you want to, what meditation actually means and what you're actually doing it for and being able to just give yourself a bit of a break in the fact that what works for one person may not work for you and that's okay because you have your own individual unique way of accessing the world and this kind of visualization thing isn't the same as our imagination because you have the inability to see pictures it doesn't mean your imagination is poor I can create guided visualizations and I get really good feedback on them, but I'm not creating them from a, a place of, you know, I can see it, so I'm writing it down and then I'm sharing it with people. I just create it from a knowing, from trusting what comes to me and following that. And some really famous people have had aphantasia too. The guy that created The Little Mermaid is this massive feat of animation. He didn't have any kind of visual imagery at all. The co-founder of Pixar doesn't have any visual imagery. And I think it's a really important thing to say that it's not, it's not a, an illness. It's not, you know, uh, something that is, is skewed or wrong. It's just the way it, that it is. So being able to kind of accept that about ourselves is the first step. And from reading online as well, lots of people say lots of different things. And some people believe that because they can't have, they don't have that, that imagery, they are less prone to developing PTSD. It's obviously not been a scientifically validated fact, 
but just from reading what other people are putting on, there's quite a theme there. Um, there's also quite a link with things like ADD and ADHD autism with visual thinking styles. Again, it hasn't been researched, but it's interesting to see what other people's ideas are. Some of the people that I've spoken to with hyperphantasia have said it's like that movie just constantly going on in their head and it can become really distracting. And although being able to have this beautiful, like extensive inner world that's so vibrant and rich and, you know, it's just as if it's real, it can also, they can also find it quite difficult to be able to focus if something does happen that's very traumatic they would remember every single detail of that and it would be very visually stimulating all the time so there are highs and lows of all of these things and what I wanted to do is I just wanted to do an episode to talk a little bit about it I could go on for ages but I, I'm trying to keep these these episodes pretty short and hopefully sweet and I'm just really interested to know what your experience is. Is this new for you? Have you thought about this before? Because I think it's literally one of those things that unless you learn it, discover it somehow, you just don't think about it because why would we ever analyze the way that we think? Normally we just try and figure out what we think or why we think it. But actually the way that we think is such an open door of opportunity to then be able to make it really work for us. I now know that I need to really trust my intuition in terms of knowing something or feeling something and that it's okay for me to do that. Does it mean that I'm never going to get frustrated about the fact that I can't remember people that I love by seeing pictures of them in my head? No, but it will help me to understand myself and get closer to being able to do the things that actually help me moving forwards and just to finish off which this could perhaps be a different podcast but I wanted to add it in is a lot of people that do have aphantasia also do not have an inner voice so an inner voice or an internal monologue is just as if I was going to stop talking right now and then transfer my voice into my head if I'm reading something my voice will say it out loud I will talk to myself sometimes I'll have a dialogue uh, let's be honest, I probably talk to myself a lot <laughs> in turn, in turn, inside my head. But it is quite common to have a, a, an inner voice in your head. It's different to hearing voices and different types of voices. Um, but it is your voice, your inner monologue. And some people don't have that. They have a complete absence. And a lot of these people actually find that they find it so much easier to switch off and not really thinking anything because they don't have this inner voice. And they're not picturing anything either. A lot of people that do have this uh, this absence of inner voice will also be hyperphantasic or on the spectrum elsewhere because they use pictures to help to bring themselves into the thought. So, for example, if I was making a, a list of shopping, I would be saying in my head, like, banana pepper I don't know what I'm cooking right now but you know I'd be right I'd be saying it all in my head whereas somebody who doesn't have that inner voice would be think it's thinking or seeing perhaps a picture of a banana a picture of a pepper and the person that doesn't have either just has this connection and it's something I can't fathom and I think as with all of these thinking styles if we're not in it it's hard for us to imagine it but from what people have described it's just kind of this connection sounds a little bit like the knowing of you know this is this is what I do but I wanted to put it out there because I think it's an important piece to help us to understand who we are and how we work so I hope that in this podcast perhaps part of you has felt like you've connected with my experience perhaps part of you cannot understand my experience in any way perhaps part of you is just already on the website trying to find out what kind of visual thinking style that you have but whichever it is I'd love to know your thoughts on this I'd love to know if you have 
been able to give yourself a break with the way that you think because of understanding this about yourself or your experience and I hope that wherever you're listening to this you're having a wonderful day and remember if it's not a good day today there's hope for tomorrow thank you so much for tuning in please if you have a moment if I could ask you one favor it would just be to subscribe to the podcast give it a review if you're on google apple spotify whatever you're listening to this podcast on or whether you're watching me on youtube so that more people hopefully can come and be part of the echoes and hear some of the wonderful interviews that i have been able to hold and share with you all i look forward to hearing all of your thoughts and i look forward to seeing you next time on the echoes Thank you.